Yes, Teresa. We were on emails together. Oh, too, hey. but, like, Nice to meet nice you. Nice to meet you. I'm going to go sit right up front in front of Lisa's face. Go for it. Our pi the pirate flags, our client. How did the door do? Not a peep. Not a yap. They're really sensitive. They're so impressive. For a while, I did a lot of work on. All right. I think that in, in part in deference to the vast numbers who are awaiting this panel online, we probably ought to begin. No. Have a opportunity, I think. I don't, we, as far as I know, there isn't any mechanism for are watching online to ask questions themselves. So those of you who are here in the room, the case that we are here to talk about today is, is Helen and Elizabeth Cooper, which argued in the Supreme Court this morning. And it's a dispute. It, it began as a dispute over um, question of whether the certain state agencies of the state of North Carolina had infringed Kishner Allen's copyright when they displayed selections from its documentation of a significant shipwreck. And that case then evolved rapidly into a very intellectually dense dispute over what was ultimately formulated as the question presented for the court to decide, namely whether Congress validly abrogated state sovereign immunity by the Copyright Remedy Clarification Act of 1990 in providing remedies for authors of original expression whose federal copyrights are infringed by states. And, and that question is, it isn't the first time, as we're going to hear, that the issue of the interaction between federal re remedies for federal intellectual property law violations on the one hand and the doctrine of state sovereign immunity have come together in collision at the Supreme Court. This time, as far as I can tell, and my distinguished panelists are encouraged to correct me, the the question presented really breaks down in, or, along two argumentative lines, one of which asks whether the patent and trademark clause of Article I itself has the effect of abrogating or at least setting the stage for the abrogation 
of sovereign immunity as a matter of law. And the other, which comes into play if the answer to the first question is in the negative, is whether Congress had a sufficient basis in 1990, a sufficient record of, of state malfeasance to validly abrogate immunity under Section 5 of the 14th Amendment. We have a very, very distinguished panel. Everyone sitting to my right had an important role to play in the formulation and the preparation and the delivery of this case. And I'm going to propose that we proceed in the following way. I'm going to ask each of you to take five minutes and do a, a summing up where you are with respect both to the case as a whole and as to the argument this morning, and then we can have a quick round of responses to the extent that we want them. Time permitting, I may then toss a few questions to you, and then at or before 6 o'clock, in any event, we'll go to the audience for whatever questions they may have. It's a complex case, far-reaching implications, both within and potentially beyond the domain of intellectual property. Obviously, any attempt to summarize it here today can't do all of its subtleties full justice. I hope, though I'm not in a position to insist, that as each of you speaks about the case from the perspective of your representation, you might focus on some of the flashpoints that are likely to be dwelt or to be to be taken up in what I suspect will be the opinions of a divided court. For myself, based on a very, very quick reading of the transcript of the oral argument, copies of which are available in the back of the room for anyone who wants one, there are a few things I'm curious about if you want to. I'll name three. First, not, not unexpectedly, there was a fair amount of discussion this morning about stare decisis. And I'm curious what all of you, and ultimately I'll be curious about what others of you who attended the argument as well, think about the possibility that this case is going to bring about a wholesale reconsideration by the court of the Florida prepaid approach to Article I abrogation. Or, conceivably, to the born against Flores approach to the application of Section 5. That's my first topic. The second one goes to the, the, the Section 5 issues. There was a good deal of discussion, as there should have been today, as, as there is in the briefs that all of you and many others filed, about whether the legislative record for the 1990 CRCA was sufficient to disclose a significant pattern of state malfeasance of the kind that might, under existing law, justify the abrogation of state sovereign immunity. And my question is this. In describing or pointing out instances of state infringement of copyrights, is it or should it be important to make a distinction between the prevalence of actual or potential claims on the one hand and the prevalence of infringement on the other? In other words, there are out there in the universe quite a few copyright claims which may in fact or another, perhaps the presence of a viable affirmative defense, not ultimately considered infringing. Are we looking in the case of an, a record under Section 5 for quantity or quality of claims, or are we looking for the prevalence of infringement? 
And there was also quite a lot of discourse this morning about intentional versus unintentional. Some members of the court were in the view that copyright might be very different from other kinds of sovereign immunity contexts because it's difficult to infringe a copyright and then entirely, or at least for a state agency, to infringe a copyright in an entirely inadvertent or unintentional manner. But on the other hand, there is intentional use on the one hand. There is intentional infringement on the other. And presumably, many of the uses that states undertake are undertaken in good faith, correctly or incorrectly, in reliance on that. So what are we looking for when we look for instances of past or possibilities of future state misbehavior? And finally, I was a little surprised in, in scanning the record that there wasn't more discussion this morning about the inadequacy or adequacy of other remedies apart from a, an abrogate, a full abrogation of state sovereign immunity about the effectiveness of injunctions or of suits against individuals in their personal capacities. And I'd love if anyone has thoughts about that hear them well. So I think, if you don't mind, we'll go in this order. The, the, the biographies of the, the distinguished speakers are available to you. I'm not going to repeat them. But here's, I think, it, it will, the order in which I'm going to ask them to speak. First, Lisa Geary, an associate at Queen Emanuel. They represented the copyright owner, petitioner, Alan. Matthew Sawchuk who oversaw the case for the respondents as Solicitor General of North Carolina, Scott Keller, the chair of the Supreme Court and common law practice of Baker Box, who filed an amicus brief for the public and land grant universities and the American Association of in support of respondent, Chris Moore, vice president for IP and general counsel at the Software and Industry Association, whose amicus brief supported and finally, Jonathan Bam, who filed on behalf of the National Library Associations, the ALA, CRL, ALA, as well as the, the, the Society of American Archivists and the Software Preservation Network in support of response. So with that, I'll sit down and hand it over to you. You can either come up or sit, and if you sit, push the button. I'll sit if that's okay. Commissioners, along with Eric Schaefer, who argued the case at the Supreme Court, and one of my other colleagues, Joanna Manillo, is joining us. So, as Peter mentioned, this case is complex, but not in the copyright sense that you might have expected from hearing there's a copyright case at the Supreme Court. And in fact, I think this case actually turned out to be a lot more about constitutional law and state sovereign immunity than the nitty gritty of copyright. So a couple of the points you mentioned, you raise copyright issues. Um, that so there were two, um, I do think there are two primary issues that were addressed today. Of course, there's, there's one question presented, and really the court's just deciding if the Copyright Remedy Clarification Act is valid, if it was constitutionally enacted. But within that, we did argue two possible grounds for the act's validity. One is under Article I, Section 8, Clause 8 of the Constitution, which we named the Intellectual Property Clause. But as you might be familiar with, it's the clause that says Congress is to secure exclusive rights to authors and inventors. And it actually doesn't use the word copyright in it. So you know, we've dubbed it the, the IP Clause, the Intellectual Property Clause. We think that. It constitutionally covers all forms of intellectual property, copyrights, and patents. Uh, and the Article I basis for abrogation is basically that uh, states in the plan of the convention agreed that under this constitutional text, they were waiving their rights to state sovereign immunity for copyright infringement when they agreed in the plan of the convention that 
Congress would be able to secure exclusive rights to authors and inventors for their creations and to promote the progress of science and the useful arts. We think the text of that clause is pretty unique among all of the Article I powers, and the court has never specifically addressed that clause and the Article I basis for application as we think it should. Uh, as Peter mentioned, there was a lot of discussion this morning at oral argument about stare decisis, and there's a few looming precedents out there that were the subject of a lot of discussion. Uh, you know, Seminole Tribe, Florida Prepaid, Cats, and our position in our brief, and again this morning, uh, what Derek argued is uh, that we don't think the court has ever squarely addressed the validity of this clause. In Florida Prepaid, when it was addressing a similar statute that had to do with patents, it was relying on uh, dicta from Seminole Tribe that the court later in Katz said was erroneous. And the question was not presented in Florida Prepaid about the Article I basis for abrogation. So it's our position that that's not a holding of Florida Prepaid, that the court, uh, you know, as Derek argued this morning, the court doesn't need to overrule wholesale anything in Florida Prepaid because that just wasn't uh, an argument that was made to the court. Neither of the parties had argued it in the case. It wasn't the question presented. It wasn't in the briefing. So we don't think it was decided. We do think, however, that Katz, the court's later decision in 2005 that addressed uh, the Article I basis for abrogation under the bankruptcy clause, we do think to get to that holding, the court undermined the foundational precedent of Florida prepaid, I guess you could say. The, it said that erroneous dicta was, or it called the dicta erroneous, it said that that was a sweeping assumption that was not true. So we're kind of taking the court's precedent post cats. And we think post cats, it means the court needs to take a fresh look at the intellectual property clause in Article I. Uh, and, to, and we think here the text of that clause shows pretty clearly a plan of the convention waiver of state sovereignty. That's I feel like these arguments are kind of complicated and circuitous, so I, if I'm, you can just glaze over at any point. <laughs> but, but that's the article and basis. And I, I think what we saw from the court this morning were questions about what exactly did we decide in Florida prepaid and what did we not decide? And what exactly did Kat say about what we said in Seminole Tribe? And so I, I think that is a question the court's going to have to like wrestle with, and they may be wrestling with is what exactly was the dicta there? What does cats mean? Uh, actually, the first question out of the gate this morning from uh, Justice Ginsburg was, I think, getting at whether cats, this case that addressed the bankruptcy clause, whether it was confined to the bankruptcy clause, or whether it actually did require kind of a, a new, fresh examination of all of the Article I powers. And I mean, we would say that it requires a clause-by-clause -clause approach, and we actually think there might only be two clauses in all of Article I that can justify this kind of abrogation, but this is one of them. So that's uh, the, you know, the Article I basis. I'll just um, mention on uh, Section 5, which is where we get into the other points Peter raised about the legislative record here um, and the whether... Congress's enactment was congruent and proportional. Uh, our argument is that the it doesn't matter which order they reach them in, we think Section 5 of the 14th Amendment provides an equally valid basis for Congress's abrogation of state sovereign immunity. And under the court's precedent, we think that the CRCA was a congruent and proportional remedy to a constitutional violation. We think the fact that the Register of Copyright here, Ralph Oman in uh, 1988, when he was commissioned to study this problem, put together a, a really robust legislative record that documented a lot of instances of state infringement of copyright and, and specifically intentional infringement. And those instances, uh, as Peter mentioned, were not necessarily all all of the instances of state infringement, but
but some of them were related to claims that had been brought. And so, you know, Ralph Oman and the witnesses before Congress testified that this was just the tip of the iceberg and that the reports they had were potentially understated uh, because in light of governing precedent, copyright holders might have thought they had no chance of bringing suit against state actors or they didn't have the incentives to do so given the state of the law. And our position on this is that the, the record here was was really strong. It was it was stronger, much stronger than the record that the court looked at in analyzing the patent issue in Florida prepaid. I think it's fundamentally different. We also think the nature of copyright infringement is different than patent infringement. It came up this morning. Um, Justice Kagan was asking about it, and uh, that copyright infringement requires actual copying. That came up a lot. She mentioned it a few times in the oral argument. And that's different because um, in order to copy someone's work, you actually have, there has to be one and then there has to be another, and, and you have to have copied that work. Patent infringement can be innocent. It can happen unintentionally. You might not have known that this other work existed. So we think that's one difference. On the uh, intentional infringement point, I do think the court, uh, they asked some questions about the evidence of intentional infringement. And while we think that all of copyright infringement has a component of intentionality about it, uh, there's also certainly cases of willful infringement that go beyond just your standard copyright infringement. And without getting too much into the facts of our case, we think that there's uh, a legislative record and a body of current evidence that suggests how states would go about intentionally infringing copyright in that they, they did and do, which makes all the difference here, we think. I think the, uh, the one other issue, I think Peter's right that it didn't come up a lot today about, um, about the inadequacy of remedies. We saw a question from the Chief Justice toward, uh, I believe, the end of Ryan's argument about qualified immunity. Um, but I was surprised that it didn't come up more often because one of the things Congress has to show that their, um, that their abrogation was concrete and proportional under Section 5 is that they considered the adequacy of state remedies. We obviously think they did that here and that they, um, they documented the reasons why injunctive relief and suits against state officers, for example, weren't adequate and why they wanted statutory damages and attorney fees specifically. Uh, but and so it's something we briefed and argued, um, but noticeably was absent from the court's discussion today until, except for maybe the chief, the chief's question about qualified immunity. Um, and on that point, we, you know, I, I think, as Derek mentioned in his rebuttal, we put in our briefs, we just don't think that remedy is adequate given the defense of qualified immunity, um, which makes these types of claims against state officers pretty insurmountable in practice. Uh, and also was something that Congress had considered. You know, proponents of the CRCA mentioned to them, well, don't you have suits against state officers? And Congress didn't think that was adequate, just like it didn't think injunctive relief was adequate um, for some of the reasons that Justice Breyer mentioned this morning in his questioning. He posited a hypothetical about uh, California showing Marvel movies or Spider-Man, and then uh, the next day you find out about it, and then they say, oh yeah, well, we showed it yesterday. Posed this series of hypotheticals, and he kept referring to the movie. He really liked the Groundhog Day reference. <laughs> but I think that's some, some of the, his question shows to us why injunctive relief wasn't adequate at the time Congress enacted this, and why it's still not adequate today, which some of our amici, uh, including Chris Moore and the others, also mentioned in their amici briefs at this point. Very good. So I'm Matt Swatchak. I'm from North Carolina. So I think Lisa and Derek have done um, uh, a very good job in, in what I think uh, many would consider an uphill battle, which is what I'm calling it here. Uh, starting with their position on. Uh, 
my sense of your argument is most of it is closed with Title IV, or one of the reasons why the policy comes from both of those clauses. I would say um, probably one critical element is along to that or to be the idea that actual sentences Very, very highly contested by the four opinions that was very much getting at the or getting at the deeply specifics of the relatively low poverty rate, especially in the realm of So to wall off or or Maybe not more than once in the Supreme Court. It might be for that reason that the court uh, turned its attention to Section 5 of the Supreme Court. It was their conversation about the congressional uh, analysis of states involved in copyright. Sense the whole section of everyone agrees that Congress really was not acting here, relying on Section 5. That Congress was uh, working in the aftermath of the gas opinion and was abrogated on the use of gas largely in 1932. The only record we have of this in the case is uh, not a Filed with the intent of satisfying the What we say is that's a pretty good sign that they have not satisfied the file. But even so, um, when we, that's the record we have, and when we look at it uh, in light of what Section 5 actually requires, um, we see that it doesn't meet the requirement. Actual constitutional violation. We that we have to be obvious violation and congruence and proportionality to uh, the remedy of the court. Lisa and Peter have already touched on the first aspect of turning a copyright infringement to a due process violation. Both sides have arguments about the, the, the lack of significance of volumes that the one recited. And there were questions of, by the court that probe exactly what is intentional in this kind of area. I would say some hypotheticals about what is intentional, maybe in some amount of tension, some amount of tension with the Bernie principle. Congress did not define constitutional obligation. Uh, there was a, a line of hypothetical Justice Kagan um, to this effect that one answer to some, some of these ideas might be Bernie bars Congress from actually defining violation and, and, and promoting non intentional significance to intentional. By way of congressional record making, which didn't happen here, but if it happened in the future, that could mean some intention with Bernie. And then, as everyone has said, the second aspect. Good? Those are sure. Good. If I uh, engage any beatboxing, I'll be well, well positioned for that later. The. Uh, the issue of the second aspect of an actual due process violation, in addition to the, uh, the infringement being intentional, 
example, is the absence of alternative remedies. And there's a fairly extensive discussion of this in our brief. One of the most interesting aspects of the alternative remedies analysis in this case, beyond those really that were discussed at any length in the argument, is there actually is a pending state law lawsuit by Mr. Allen's business partner against North Carolina. Now, um, Derek and Lisa would be quick to point out that maybe the exact gravamen of the currently pending claims is not uh, copyright infringement. But again, we're, at that point, we're slicing the remedies relatively thinly um, in a situation where the question is, are there enough alternative remedies to prevent an outright due process violation? That's a fun discussion. And then another place where the record compiled in, in late 80s, early 90s may come up short is on the finding of widespread violation. You know, the, both the, the numerosity of them, the intensity of them, and the, the tailoring of the remedies. Again, Congress didn't even really have those goals in mind. And I think both sides can, can cite their favorite parts of the record, but I think we can all agree that was not even what Congress was trying to do here, which makes a lot less likely that Congress did achieve it. You know, at a minute, it's, it's hard for Congress to achieve some things that it even affirmatively uh, tries to do, but when it doesn't even have that goal in mind, that ought to tell us something. So those are some observations on the Section 5 aspect of it. I think took up probably in, in a sense, probably 65, 70% of We're going to make a slight shift because the next set of presentations are from individual students filed on behalf of various friends of the court. So they will have the opportunity to address these things, but also to talk about the consequentiality of the organization. All right, we're good. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here with you. Uh, I appreciate you hosting uh, this uh, panel today. You know, I got to say that this case, and I think we hit it on the head, in, this case turned into, it hadn't already been, a common law case as opposed to a big intellectual property fight. Now, don't get me wrong, the stakes for intellectual property are very high. I know we're going to get into some of that. But this is really the first big state sovereign immunity case that the Roberts Court has had. And you've heard, you know, City of Bernie, Florida prepaid, cats, all these cases that we're rattling off. Those all came from the Rehnquist Court. And one of the pillars of the Rehnquist Court's, call it federalism revival, was additional protections for state sovereign immunity. Uh, and additional limitations on powers of Congress. So City of Bernie would have been limiting the powers of Congress. And or to prepaid, cats, also various other cases would have been reinvigorating protections for state sovereign immunity. Cats, though, at the very tail end of, uh, I think it was Justice O'Connor in one of her last uh, big decisions that she would have been in a 5 4 majority, found that under the bankruptcy clause, state sovereign immunity had been abrogated. And so in a lot of ways, that kind of left this lasting ambiguity as to what's the scope of the protections of state sovereign immunity going forward after the Rehnquist Court. So it's taken about a dozen years, but the court finally had a case and has been teed up, uh, ably explained by uh, petitioner and respondents. So we represented, as an amicus, uh, scores of universities represented by two trade organizations, the Association of Public and Land Grant Universities and the Association of American Universities. And the main thrust of our arguments in the court was universities have all sorts of checks on them as to they're not going to be engaging in widespread copyright infringement. In fact, universities spend tons of money purchasing copyrighted material. And one of the key prongs of the doctrine in state sovereign immunity, as you've heard, is, is there, did Congress find there was a wide, were there widespread violations? And the reason why the court has included that is to make sure 
that what Congress is doing is congruent and proportional to its constitutional powers. Well, we submitted, and we were arguing on behalf or in support of the respondent, is that Congress found nothing close to that. And there was a colloquy today, an oral argument, where Justice Kagan brought up uh, saying, like, well, it looks in the record that there were about 16 examples of uh, this, these violations over 13, 13 states, 13 years, I forget exactly what it was. And then she noted, well, in Florida prepaid, the previous precedent, there were eight examples. And she said, well, how many is enough? Is eight not enough and 16 is enough? You know, where do you draw that line? I know Justice Alito picked up on, on some of that question as well. Uh, and 16 examples, and I think picking off the the moderator mentioned too, some of the back and forth, I think, in the record needs to also take account of just because someone files a lawsuit, that doesn't mean it's in fact a violation. So you need not only violations, you need widespread violations where Congress can go and abrogate a state sovereign immunity in this area. Um, and particularly when you have internal pressures, political dynamics that are keeping governments from engaging in widespread intellectual property violations. I think part of the reason why Congress didn't find that is because it didn't exist. Uh, we talk about alternative remedies, too. You know, I, I was interested, you know, Justice Breyer kind of, he kind of shooed away the, the efficacy of injunctive relief uh, in this context, because just to put this in, what we're talking about is, can you sue a state for money damages in this context for copyright violations? Everyone agrees you can always get an injunction to stop it. The question is, can you get money damages? Well, if you can always get, if you can have injunctive relief, would that be an alternative remedy to stop these violations? Justice Breyer seemed to say, no, that's not going to be the case because, well, if someone violated well, in the past, what are we going to do going forward? I got to tell you, from representing many government officials, if you say there's an injunction in place, you're going to be held in contempt if you violate that. They are going to react. They are going to obey that injunction. They are not going to fight. And so, you know, I know that the injunctive remedy remedial component wasn't a huge part of the argument today. Um, and so, therefore, you would assume it's not going to be a key part. But I'll throw that out there as an example where, you know, I think some of the perspective that, you know, amicus can bring is giving that new and different perspective. Parties have to rightfully spend a ton of time dealing with what are the facts, what are the legal precedents, what are the, uh, you know, the implications for these doctrinal arguments. And I think you're going to see some of the arguments that we're able to bring are those more practical aspects. And so with that, um, I think I'll stop there and really look forward to the back and forth and any of your questions. Fritz? Uh, is that? Yeah, it sounds like it's okay. Uh, so uh, I represent the creatively named Software and Information Industry Association. Um, and we had, uh, first of all, I want to... Uh, Thank you all for inviting me, and uh, particularly the two folks on the end for coming today, because you all have to be beat. <laughs> so it's really, uh, it's really nice of you to give your time to this. Um, and for us, this is a lot of fun, because the amici never get to talk. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the other thing I would like to do uh, as, at the outset is uh, to convey uh, Matt Williams' regrets. He uh, had to and um, a funeral uh, for one of his partners today, um, but he very much liked, would have liked to have been here. Uh, with that said, uh, I want to uh, begin with something that may or may not be a, uh, a background assumption, which is we have a set of laws. We may not like the, uh, we may not like them. We may think that some of us may think, for example, that the statutory damage penalties are excessive. Some of them may. Some of us may feel differently about that, but we're all generally in the same, I come at it as, okay, well, we both have, have to play by the same sets of rules with the same sets of risks. So when, for example, a state university makes millions of dollars off of licensing uh, and can sue people into oblivion for ripping off those rights, they should be uh, accountable in the exact same way uh, when they infringe on the rights of others. Um, as my dad used to say, well, that's, that, that, may not, that may be right, but it's not so. Um, and the 11th Amendment makes that not so. Uh, and so we have today uh, 
three, I, I think three points. I mean, on the, it is, I do agree. I think this was a con law case. And con law cases, in my experience, are generally about limits. And so, in other words, what's the limit to your position? I think the hardest thing about the Article I argument from our side is that uh, the limit is going to have to be very carefully articulated. Because it would seem to me to be unlikely that all of those other cases that were mentioned before, like Seminole Tribe, and, um, are going to be completely discarded. And I would be surprised if the court wanted to see a whole bunch of Commerce Clause cases coming down the pike later on, despite you know, the Congress's unquestioning power to regulate it, right? So, uh, but I will say that that argument was made about as well as it could possibly have been made. Um, so we uh, left, as Miki, uh, we left our, uh, that argument to, to the petitioner. Uh, and we made a couple of other points based on what the First Circuit did, uh, rather the Fourth Circuit did. Um, the, one of the things that the Fourth Circuit did wrong uh, that we uh, kind of harped on a bit was uh, to declare the statute invalid uh, based on a failure to recite magic words. In other words, the failure to expressly uh, intone the words of the 14th Amendment. Uh, we believe that there was no authority for that. That was one of the things we harped on. It was not discussed at, um, at oral argument, I don't believe. Uh, but it, and it doesn't seem to be a focus of what the court is concerned about. Um, the second thing we did, which was also discussed at some length already, uh, is to, to discuss the legislative record. Um, and I think there are a couple of interesting points that I would bring up. I mean, the first is the idea that, particularly in the in the time period from let's say 1998, or rather 1988 onward, um, that copyright infringement was hard to detect. It's easy to detect uh, is wrong, uh, and that's particularly true uh, in the case of software, uh, where we had you know over deployment <clears throat> at that time computers were not connected. There was no way to tell whether someone had bought one copy and installed 50 on purpose because they didn't feel like paying for the other 49. The record that Congress did get uh, amassed in a very short time. And it amassed in the wake of a very long period of time in which everybody thought that states were liable. The other thing I would say, and this did come up a bit in oral argument, and it's an interesting question, uh, which is, Okay, you have this record. I'd submit that it is a record that uh, came forward very quickly, relatively quickly. Uh, and Congress, they're going to make a predictive judgment. So what deference do you have to give that predictive judgment when you're dealing with a statute passed under Section 5? How do you, there were questions about, I think Justice Kagan asked about that, how to handle that at the end. And I think there, you know, there are areas where Congress is probably not due deference, and there are areas where they probably are. Uh, one of the areas where they probably are uh, is when they're gauging the effect of technological change on a particular activity. And there is evidence in the legislative record that they were concerned about the effect of, uh, you know, what was then internet technology, but embryonic by comparison. Uh, on the ability of other people to infringe. That is due deference. That is the kind of determination that courts are not terribly good at making and probably a court to make. Um, the second thing that is, the other question that to me is interesting and has never really been satisfactorily answered um, is this idea of state remedies. In other words, Congress preempted uh, every qualitatively equivalent court uh, that could be construed as copyright infringement. Every equivalent right, with the exception of sound recordings and all that, like stick the foot on and whatever. But as a general matter, things like uh, you know misappropriation outside of very narrow bounds, unfair competition, all those things are routinely canned on a motion to dismiss. So, and Congress did that. So if it does that, does it have to allow for state remedies? Does it have to consider all the state remedies that might theoretically be available? Or is it, okay, here's the law that we wrote to affect our purpose. There are no additional state remedies under this scheme, and therefore we are entitled to act. Um, I don't know the answer to that question, based on what 
came today. Um, the final point that we made, which came up, um, was we were concerned, uh, and this, there was some discussion of the United States versus Georgia and the Hibbs case on this, which is the constitutionality of the statute as applied, is what it comes down to. And what that means is, if you have an a, a specific factual allegations against the state that they've engaged in, in conduct that would violate the Constitution, can you bring that claim into federal court? Um, and our, our friends in the state, at the state, uh, although we probably disagree on what the elements of a due process violation would look like, seem to suggest that, yeah, such a case could be brought, provided that you hit certain thresholds the availability of state remedies being one, and some level of intentionality or non-negligence um, being the other. Uh, so that's, yeah, that's the sum and substance. I'll pause there. Uh, thank you very much for having me here. So I represented uh, library associations, and then we also uh, brought in uh, the, as Peter mentioned, the Society of American Archivists and also the Software Preservation Network. And um, what I saw, our role as, as Amici was really, as others have said, this really is a con law case. But what we saw, our role was, was to explain what were the copyright implications of this con law case. Meaning, what was the implication, what would be the implications for uh, the, the, the state entities. Uh, and in particular, what we were talking about was the uh, possible uh, impact on uh, digital preservation. So libraries uh, and archives at state institutions, uh, library, you know, universities and colleges, but also you have state archivists and so forth, uh, are engaged in mass digitization of their collections. And they're doing that because the collections are at risk. And so we explain in detail all the potential risks that these collections face from fire, from flooding, uh, just the normal deterioration. It, it sort of was a little bit like you know, the, the, of the, the, the plagues in Egypt, about all the, all the, all the risks that uh, libraries and archives face. And then we sort of said, so, so now you have, and that's been a problem in the past, but now we have this new technology, digitization, which allows the preservation of these works. And so libraries and archives uh, across the country are uh, engaging in preservation. Um, the problem is that, you know, what is the lawfulness of making all of these copies? Now, there have been several cases uh, in the past decade or so, suggest to, indicating that the copying is a fair use. But again, that's not all, not, not all circuits have reached that conclusion. I mean, any case court that has considered it has reached that conclusion, but you only have decisions in uh, three or four circuits. You don't have decisions in all circuits. Moreover, even though the act of preservation quite clearly is a fair use, the kind of access you're allowed to provide to that work is unclear, so the, 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 there's much less uh, unanimity in the decisions. And therefore, uh, there is this degree of uncertainty. Um, and then as others have mentioned, the, and, and, the, and this came up several times uh, during the oral argument, the, uh, with statutory damages, the potential liability that a library could face by sort of making the wrong judgment uh, concerning uh, the access it provides to a digitized collection uh, could be significant. And so uh, that's where sovereign immunity comes in, that sovereign immunity has provided these state-run uh, institutions with an added degree of comfort uh, when they're engaging in this mass digitization. Um, and, uh, and that comfort goes away if sovereign immunity is abrogated. And so, you know, that, that's what our pitch was, was that this is, uh, that, that they're, that they're uh, even though, you know, one can, in this case, uh, you know, sort of focus on the facts of uh, uh, 
uh, black, you know, uh, of, of you know what was going on with uh, you know Blackbeard's ship and you know the, the photographs and so forth. But that's not what's really going on on a day-to-day -day basis. And and you know, Scott's brief did the same thing, talking about what's really going on on campuses and the kind of systemic use of works and how if you have a systemic infringement, then injunctive relief is a perfectly adequate remedy. And that's you know that was you know I, I thought Ju Justice Breyer's hypothetical really was you know, very easy to respond to, that if a university is systematically sort of engaged, or, or you know, the state of California is engaged in a systematic streaming enterprise, and said, oh, they charge $5 a day. I mean, if, if, if uh, the state of California runs a Netflix-like streaming enterprise, injunctive relief will work, believe me. Um, and so, um, uh, you know, but, but taking away sovereign immunity could have this negative impact on our, the preservation of our cultural heritage. Now, now my final point on this issue of uh, amicus briefs and the right role of an amicus brief, and, and, and Chris mentioned you know, that you know, the amici never get to speak, and so we're very grateful for the opportunity to speak. The other thing, the greatest worry uh, uh, or the greatest fear an amici has is that uh, an amicus would have, I guess given that we're singular, and I'm showing my knowledge of Latin here, um, uh, the greatest fear you have is that you will be ignored, uh, which of course is a great risk. And so first of all, I'm very glad that in petitioner's reply brief, they didn't ignore us, they just sort of made fun of us, uh, but at least they paid attention to us. Um, and then even more so that uh, 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 North Carolina today in the oral argument uh, at the very end sort of referred to our brief in terms of the impact. So hopefully, hopefully, you know, we'll, the justices will at least cite our brief. Now, whether they'll be persuaded is another question, but, you know, the, the most important thing for an amicus is not to be ignored, so. I was not there this morning, and I'm very curious when Ms. Gary mentioned, oh gosh, I do, I was wondering why my voice was, <laughs> I have a loud voice, but <laughs> no, I think, I think I'm, I'm being heard. Um, when Ms. Gary mentioned there, there were a number of questions about what we did and did not decide in Florida prepaid, um, my question would be is, is and I, I know lawyers hate to guess, it's an unnatural exercise. They may want this for the record. Oh, I see. My question, my question is, um, would any of you, all of you, venture some guesswork, um, you know, wishful thinking or not, depending on, on each person's respective positions, about where you think the court might be leaning on how broadly or narrowly to recall what they decided in Florida prepaid? All right, I'll go there. Uh, okay, so uh, there are, I, I think, uh, of the possible outcomes, repudiation of Florida prepaid is the least likely is, is probably, I mean, look, standard caveat, right? Handicapping oral argument, dangerous, dangerous occupation. Um, and um, I will say that when they took this case, looking at it, uh, you know, my, my sense uh, was basically of impending doom. Um, but the, I, I will say after the, uh, after the oral argument, I honestly don't know how this is going to play out. Mm. Um, I think we will get, we, we may well get um, a better ruling than we expected, but I just don't know what that ruling is going to look like. But, 
Yeah, I, I agree with Chris that um, I, I think the court is going to be very reluctant to uh, overturn Florida prepaid. And, uh, you know, petitioner basically conceded that if you to, if you buy into the first amend the first the uh, the Article One argument, you have to reverse uh, Florida prepaid. In the briefs, they kind of were sort of wiggling about that, but but in the oral argument, said, "Yeah, okay, you're going to have to one way or the other. Florida prepaid would be gone if you uh, rule in favor on the Article One argument." Uh, with respect to um, uh, the, the, the 14th Amendment, yeah, I, I kind of agree with Chris. It's kind of, I don't know. I mean, it, it really could go uh, any different, any diff different direction. It really is, is uh, uh, hard to predict. Welcome to the Phil Donahue Show. I think you could talk a little bit more about the differences in incentives between injunctive relief and monetary damages. So uh, I understand that there might be a, a difference in incentives for private corporations, but for the government, when they don't necessarily have a profit motive, would monetary relief carry the same weight as injunctive relief, or could it carry more weight? In I was hoping, especially if Ms. Geary could talk about, um, because the, uh, the petitioner, I think, is saying that injunctive relief isn't sufficient. I was hoping you could offer some arguments for why it wouldn't be. So I, I think that's a, a great question, especially the distinction you raised. It's obviously they have a profit motive, but I, I would suggest that they do have a purse, and they are very concerned about the uh, the demands made on that purse. And so, in terms of purely incentives, I think there's no question that allowing suits for money damages against states is probably going to be a stronger incentive setting aside whether you think it's a necessary one, but just I think a suit for money damages against states allowing that to go forward is going to be an incredibly strong incentive um, for them to not infringe copyrights. In terms of whether injunctive relief would be adequate, whether you would need the money damages, you know, when Chris was talking, I, I, it made me recall um, the Dow Jones amicus brief, which was offered in our support. I think is an instance uh, of, it shows why injunctive relief might not be adequate. And essentially, um, the Dow Jones publications had thousands of their works posted online by a California state agency. And if you think about it, part of the validity and the value of a copyright is access to that work. And especially if you have um, copyright holders who are restricting access to their work, and that work is then made public by an infringer. An injunctive, an injunction might prevent that infringer from, you know, continuing to provide the access to the protected work. But you can't, you can't close the barn door, so to speak, once it's been put out there. And I think there. Maybe there are instances where injunctions work, and I have you know, no doubt that Scott knows his clients well and that they, I'm sure, adhere to injunctions when they are issued. But the question is whether Congress had a basis to believe that injunctions would be adequate to prevent state copyright infringement. And I think they had a pretty robust record of instances of infringement like that Dow Jones and, and our other industry are now also echoing where the fact that states were making even access available to something um, that, was, that would only have been given with the copyright holder's license and permission and consent, I think is, illustrates why injunctive relief is inadequate here. Also, the one other thing Congress mentioned was that 
um, copyrights are hard to value sometimes. And so while injunctive relief might in some cases stop further infringement, it doesn't really do much to give the copyright holder back the value they had. And copyrights being kind of inherently difficult to value uh, need something like statutory damages. One point I might make on the other side, there was an interesting turn in the argument was where uh, Lisa's colleague, uh, Derek, noted the point that Lisa just made too, which is that actual damages of, of a, an alleged state infringement right, might be unmeasurable or, or small, and therefore it was argued that um, statutory damages are necessary. And that's really something that shows it's almost a question of, of what your priors are and, and what your which of the two uh, sets of considerations you're giving weight to. Because if the argument is there have to be multi-thousand dollar awards of, of statutory damages, um, first of all, that, that is the taxpayer's money. Um, second, consider the congruence and proportionality analysis. A situation where there might be zero or modest or unmeasurable actual damages, talking about a, outright abrogation of the immunity, um, you know, is that well tailored to that modest uh, damage as opposed to sort of a functional analysis saying, hey, if we're going to prevent copyright infringement, um, and preventing copyright infringement, all of it may or, you know, is not what we're measuring against. We're talking about preventing a subset of copyright infringement, process violation, whether we've done so in a tailored way. That's what I think makes the discussion pretty good. If I could just ask one follow-up question. Uh, are statutory damages typically used? I'm not familiar with the field, but uh, when calculating damages for a copyright infringement, do they usually look to the statute, or do they usually speculate as to what they're doing? But I would think the plaintiff perspective is go straight for the statutory damages. It, in, mo in most cases, I think that's probably true. So the way it works is um, you elect statutory damages, uh, essentially before. And if you do that, um, it depends on the circuit, but it's basically a, it's a 14-factor test. And the jury finds within a range, give or take. Um, and, and so there are things that can be considered, such as uh, the level of uh, good or bad faith on the part of the defendant, how careful they were, for example, if they're, uh, the $150,000 number is available only in cases of uh, willful infringement. Um, and I would probably go on as far to say it's willful and completely undefended um, because it's, it's very, I, I can't say it's never happened, but off the top of my head, I can't remember a case where um, somebody has gotten the full amount in the absence of a default judgment. Uh, so all of the things that make states allegedly good actors would be in front of the jury and would be um, factored into whatever the ultimate award was. There may be other cases where um, you would go for actual damages. I mean, we were an, um, we were an amicus in uh, a case in Oregon um, involving Oracle, uh, who also filed. And there, uh, you know, the claim damages were in the billions of dollars. The, the statutory damages is for a particular piece of software was just a footnote in that case. So it, it's really, it's up to the plaintiff to pick which, whichever one they believe will vindicate their rights at the end of the proceeding. Well, for us, uh, that was uh, the big fear. Um, uh, and, and that, that, uh, Libraries and, and universities more generally use huge numbers of works. And so once you start doing the calculation of uh, you know, the, the number of works used times the statutory damages, you're getting to a big number very quickly. Um, and, and the one can certainly imagine a uh, a, a general counsel at a university uh, sort of saying, well, okay, once you start doing the, the back of the envelope calculation, that if you engage in a certain project, then you are 
facing the risk of literally billions of dollars in statutory damages, the general counsel is going to say no. Okay, and so if you think of projects like, um, and, and we talk about these in our brief, so the, 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 the Google Books project uh, where libraries partnered with Google and, and Google uh, digitized, um, digitized a large number of works and then the libraries had a consortium. And so this was, there, there were two cases, but there was the Google Books case and the Hathi Trust case. Um, court, in, courts in both cases found that that activity to be a fair use. But the potential exposure uh, had, had these universities been subject to statutory damages would have been enormous. And you know, it's like no accident that the universities that partnered with Google, sort of like the initial universities and the ones that were most active in the project uh, at, before the fair use determination, were all state universities, right? Especially in the University of Michigan. It's like it's no accident that they would feel more comfortable sort of engaging in fair use. Uh, and that's and that really also gets to the whole issue of you know intentional infringement and so forth. That uh, and 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 uh, some of the justices were asking about, and I think that uh, North Carolina very ably sort of focused on the fact that yeah, but you know copyright is different. I mean, yes, it is true that there is, you know that you are copying, but that doesn't mean that you know that you're infringing, right? Because so much activity, and particularly activity at, uh, at universities uh, and other educational institutions, so much of it is, falls within the scope of fair use. And you know, we don't want to have a chilling effect on fair use. Last question. Hello, uh, my name is Tom Barker. I'm a student here. And I apologize if you guys covered any of this earlier. I was in class earlier today. Um, my question was based on this case and how you see them going one way or the other, how do you think that could affect um, situations where the state incorporates guidance documents into its statutes? Uh, maybe guidance isn't the best idea, but you know, copyrighted material into a statute like we were looking at. In Georgia case, um, as well as when you're looking at notice and comment, the potential for copyrighted material, how do those effects potentially play out under the state? So it, it, it just a thought that so Justice Ginsburg <laughs> sort of picked up on that, and she said, you know, and this is the point that, that Chris was making. She said, said, it's a little, isn't it um, unseemly for uh, a, a state to, on the one hand, assert in a copyright and, and allege that other people are infringing its copyrights when then it turns around and says, well, we can't be sued for infringement. And, and the, uh, the, uh, uh, the Georgia Code annotated, uh, or the official, official Georgia Code annotated case, I think, uh, that's what it's, the subject matter, I think, is a perfect case of you know, saying, is that appropriate? And, and it was very interesting, at least what I thought I heard, uh, uh, the North Carolina say is that um, if uh, if Congress chose to pass a statute that, um, that 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 said that states could not own copyright, that would be constitutional. And so that was you know I I, I, thought, I think he said that. Yeah. And and uh, <clears throat> so I thought that that was sort of an interesting an interesting uh, statement. And and maybe you know take my library had often just expressed my own view. I think that that's probably right. I mean, I think it's great that the, you know, US, there's no copyright in US government works. And I think that that probably should be true for state government works as well. I mean, either way, I mean, that it's, US government works don't have copyright because we pay for it, right? And so the people should be allowed to use what they pay for. And the, the same principle should apply at the state level. But that's just my own personal opinion.
So thank you all for coming and I pray that you are listening to my speaking or what you think you are. That's good.